We got any freshmen in the room? You're going to be freshmen? Freshmen. I knew these, I knew these four freshmen guys uh, back in the 90s, and they were kind of the big men on campus at their high school as far as, you know, freshmen coming up, and there was this party going on on the weekend, and so these seniors in high school were going to take these four guys under their wings and kind of show them the ropes as far as the parties and the girls and the things that go along with that. And there was this girl at the party from another town who had a reputation, and you know what I mean. And so the, the four senior guys had this plan, or I'm sorry, there were four freshman guys, but these two senior guys had, had this plan, and they were going to get this girl alone in a bedroom. And this one particular bedroom in the house, so it goes, had these windows that led right, you know, you could watch from the outside. And so they set these four freshman guys up and basically told them what they were going to do, and you stay here and watch and learn, and these two seniors took this girl into the bedroom, and things begin to happen, and these four freshman guys are watching from the outside, and at some point, some things that were going on made the girl uncomfortable, and she got up and was angry, and there was an argument, and she runs out of the house, but the door that she exits the house from goes right out to where these four freshman guys were standing, and of course, she was humiliated, and she ran to her car, and here's these four freshman guys, and these these two seniors come outside, and they're laughing, and they're all high-fiving. And I'll never forget walking to this girl's car, ashamed of myself, even, even at a young age as being a freshman in high school. But my dad had, had raised me to respect girls and respect women and that they are not objects. And I always wanted to be a leader... And, and amen, that's good, but I did not have this yet. It's not going where you think it is. I'm walking to this girl's car ashamed of myself because I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to stand up and do good things, but I, and I got to her car, and she couldn't start her car, and I remember just kind of stupidly saying, is there anything I can do to help? And she said some things to me that I deserved, that we all deserved, and her car started, and I, I wasn't a church person, wasn't religious, didn't pray, but... I would have just thanked the Lord that she got her car started because she drove away. And I wish I could tell you, so you could clap, that I walked back and told these guys, you know, that we were wrong. And this, this young girl is obviously confused and broken like the rest of us. And we shouldn't treat people like that. But I, I didn't. I changed. Or I turned around and I lied. And I told these guys, these seniors and these three freshman buddies, that I said some things to her that I thought would make them laugh. And we all high-fived. I was a failure. It's so many things. 14. The very end of my junior year, 17 years old, I woke up in the back seat of a car, and I was woken up by, by a flashlight. We'd been pulled over. This policeman had come, and he had this flashlight. And um, I remember looking around, and I remembered some of what had happened that night. We'd, I'd been at a party, and I was drunk, and I was bored, and I left there with a few girls and a couple of guys from another town that I didn't really know, and um, they were going to go somewhere else, and I was bored and wanted to go with them, and I'm in the back of this car, and I remember some other things that happened along the way that I'm not going to share from a stage, but the, the light that came on me allowed me to see that I had nothing on except my underwear, and I had left the house that we had been at like that, and I remember running my hand through my, hairs and my hair, and my hair was all greasy because I hadn't showered in several days, and I remember looking at my fingernails, and they were dirty. And I'd been brought home by the police several times in my young life, but I could only imagine what my mom would say and think of me when I was marched up the stairs with the police almost naked. And I was ashamed of myself. And before the policeman even got to the, the driver, he got a call on his radio that there had been a robbery. And so he says to the driver that I didn't even know, hey, you kids get home right now. And he runs off. And I remember laughing. And taking the bottle of liquor that I'd had behind my back and washing down that previous guilt with a drink. I was still a failure in so many ways. It was just three weeks later. It was right before my senior year of high school started. I was at home alone and I was drunk. This is what I did every night before bed because the butterflies in my stomach would never shut up and stop. If you walked on campus, I know what I look like. I get it. But I was the big man on campus. Uh, I mean, even my junior year, I was the life of the party, the center of that little crowd. 
but I was so insecure and broken on the inside and scared all the time. And for, I thought alcohol, since it would do this thing that it does in our bodies, I thought that would help me be who I really was on the inside. And this night, just a few weeks before my junior year ended, I remember just alone, past midnight, walking outside at some time around May. And if you know anything about the Midwest, in May, you get a lot of rain. And when storms begin to come in the Midwest, you can smell them coming. You don't even have to see the lightning or hear the thunder. But when it's coming, you smell it. And I remember walking outside, waiting for the rain, walking to the street, into the street. And finally, it began to rain, I mean, pour. And I remember, like, being angry. And I, this is all in retrospect. I don't remember my thoughts real clearly, but I was angry at life and the world and if there was a God at God because I knew there was something more. I just didn't know what it was. But I remember having an expectation, believing, feeling, sensing in my bones that something was getting ready to happen. But nothing happened. It just kept raining. And I passed out on the curb, head in the gutter. I know that because a few college guys were in town, home, out of school, and they drove by my house and saw me there and picked me up and carried me inside. Still a failure. And we've all got them. We've all got these failures, these things, these stories. It doesn't matter what the story is or what it sounds like or if it's a good tale. You've got yours and I've got mine. And even people that are followers of Jesus, that follow close by him, they have these stories too. Stories like Peter the closest of followers, and our failures are megaphone loud. You know this. Screaming, shouting from dark corners of our souls, I know you. I remember you. I remember the real you. How often Peter must have heard that megaphone. Peter, the one who caught so many fish with Jesus next to him in his boat, that the boat began to sink, and then Peter sank to his knees, admitting his failure in Luke chapter 5. And Peter, the one who walked on water, right? Like the dude walked on water. And yes, he eventually sank. That's Matthew 14. Matthew 16, Jesus was the one. Excuse me, Peter was the one who identified Jesus as the Messiah. You're the Messiah, the Son of God. This was Peter. But then Jesus began to tell them about how he would go to Jerusalem and be tortured and crucified and you got to understand something. Peter rebuked him for that, not because Peter's a punk, but because Peter was a good Jew. The Jews were expecting a Messiah, and Peter believed he was right in front of him, but the Messiah, the Jews believed, was going to be a military Messiah, coming with muscles, you know? Starting a revolution, putting Israel back on top, kicking Rome out, and now this Messiah is talking about being crucified. You know who gets crucified? Bad broken failures. So Peter rebukes him, to which Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. To Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God, but mere human things, failure. And Peter was the one who told Jesus the night before Jesus died, Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. Even if everybody else denies you, I never will. I'll go to the death for you, Jesus and only hours later, you know the story, Peter curses the heavens, declaring he never, he doesn't even know who Jesus is. And the Bible tells us that Jesus looks, where he's being interrogated from, he looks directly at Peter. And Peter runs out of the courtyard and weeps bitterly. Have you ever wept over your failures? I have. I met Jesus my senior year of high school, half drunk in my bedroom, encountering evil things that I didn't believe existed. I ended up getting baptized in a bathtub at 3 in the morning, and 12 months later, I went to Bible college. From the time I came to Christ that night, five years passed, and I was a full-time youth pastor. There's probably something wrong with that, but still, I was a youth pastor. And I got, I got a phone call. This is 1998 uh, in April. And I got a phone call. I, I remember that time period well. That's April 1998. I was going to turn 22 June 18th, 1998. I was going to get married June 27th, 1998. So this was April 1998. And I got a phone call from my friend 
a friend that I grew up with, that I partied with, that I played football with, he just signed a, an NFL contract. And he was having all the old gang over to his parents' house to celebrate. And so we finished up our high school Bible study, and I, and I drove over, and I was late. The guys had been there for a while, and I hadn't seen a lot of these guys. Even though it was close by, I hadn't seen a lot of them since high school. And they were out on the deck, the back deck, and most of them were already drunk, and there were just cases of beer. And that didn't tempt me. That wasn't a problem. I, I sat down, I hugged these guys, and we talked. And then guys that are about five, year, five years out of high school, these guys began to, to do what guys that age do. They begin to talk as if they're old men, right? Like, dude, 21, you know what I mean? I'm 41 now. So like 21, you're not old. It's okay, right, if there's any young youth pastors in here. But these guys begin to tell, you know, old stories that happened like six years before. And they begin to tell these stories. And here's the, I, I'm not going to qualify this, just most of the, the stories had me as like a central role in the story. And these guys would get to that part of the story, and then they'd stop and look awkwardly at me. And then they'd skip that part and move on and, and, and finish telling the story. But I didn't skip it. And here's the thing. It's not like I'd forgotten that I had a broken past, but I had not thought about those things since. And to be honest, as a new pastor, I kind of saw myself as pretty spiritual, as pretty put together. Because, like, come on, I went to Bible college, bro. Like, you know, I knew words like exegetical, right? Like, I remember the first time I heard the word exegesis. It's not the, I, th I heard that. I thought it had something to do with Jesus, right? It's spelled with a G, though. It means to, like, e bring things out of, exit out of, right? Like, the first time. Anyway, it's not even a funny story. But anyway, so, like, I'm, I kind of thought I was, like, the stuff. I'm like, a, I'm a professional Christian. And then there I am with these guys surrounded by beer on this deck, being reminded, oh, because they skipped it, but I didn't. And it was story after story. And it played in my mind like a movie reel over and over. It's like just getting smacked in the soul. And I hugged all the guys at the end of the night. I got in my little car. And it, it, it was about an eight-minute drive home. I didn't get home for an hour. I kept having to pull over because I couldn't see through the tears. I was so broke. I still had not dealt with so much of who I had been of allowing the grace of God to wash over me, that I was so ashamed. I saw myself as a failure. I, back then, I never told stories like I told you when I would teach in the youth ministry. Failure. Sin puts us all on common ground. That's what it does. And it's why Jesus came. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, here's what Jesus said. I have come to give my life as a rescue. The literal word he uses there is a ransom, but it's to rescue you and I from sin. It's why Jesus came. And you know the story of Jesus. He challenges the religious powers of his day. I mean, like, and not like, not like pulling back like a couple layers at a time, you know, sweet, mild, gentle Jesus. No, no, no. Like bazooka full, blow the whole thing down, right? Challenging the religious powers of his day, including because here's what he did. He said, social outcasts that the religious elite said do not belong. He said, no, no, not only do they belong, but they're up front. They get first place in line. Jesus, as a, as a rabbi, had female followers. Not a big deal today. Back then, scandalous. Foreigners, you're welcome. Jesus would bring them in as well. Children who were looked at as a nuisance. Jesus gave them a blessed position in the kingdom of God. Jesus would preach a scandalous gospel that God's love is safe for everybody. This is Jesus. And he challenges this religious power of the day. Who gets in bed with, so you got the Jewish religious leaders who get in bed with Rome, the political power of the entire world in that day. And they conspire together to be done with Jesus. And Romans had perfected Crucifixion. Now, we know a little bit about crucifixion. It's, we see it. We've seen movies. But Rome had perfected this art, this torturous art of execution. And the goal, though, was not just to kill the person. Rome would do that to their own citizens when they committed the highest crimes. They'd cut their head off. You're dead like that. 
because it was actually a grace given to the person. Crucifixion, on the other hand, they wanted to make it as painful as possible without killing you. That was the idea of crucifixion and the flogging that came before it. They'd stretch them out naked and use these. And it's not like whipping like, like, you know, like this. The whole idea, it was called a cat of nine tails. It was a leather uh, whip that had nine strands off the handle, leather strands. And uh, intertwined with these nine strands were sheep bone and glass and metal. And so the idea was just to lay the cat of nine tails out on the back buttocks and legs and let it catch and hook into the meat and then slice down. We have historical reports that like internal organs were visible. This is what they did to Jesus before the cross, before the crucifixion. And then he would have been, and I know in movies he has a robe on and he should or at least something around, but, but he would have been naked. It was part of the humiliation. And often we see depictions of the cross being high up on the hill of Golgotha. A busy Jewish street ran right in front of that hill called Golgotha that looked like a skull. But they would hammer the crucifixions down so that the person would be almost eye level with the people passing by. So they could spit and mock. This is what the powers did to Jesus. And he spoke seven times from the cross words of forgiveness and prayer, but he also spoke human words of thirst and doubt. Well, you know this one probably, Matthew chapter 27, verse 47, excuse me, 46. It says at about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This may be the most human and beautiful moment of Jesus' life because in this, he stands with us. And that's part of what the cross is, this fidelity of God with people. Jesus stands with us saying, I understand, I feel it, I experience this God-forsakenness part of life. This where are you, God? This how, this like, it's not fair I didn't do anything that deserves this, and yet I'm experiencing this. And I'm sure you, because you're human, have experienced something. It might, yeah, maybe it's not a cross, but some type of where are you, God? Why, God? It's not fair. God, Jesus stands with you and I on the cross, and then with one of his last breaths, he cries out. It is finished. Jesus said that he'd come to rescue our souls. And according to Jesus on the cross, that work was now finished. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, which may be the most profound verse in the whole New Testament, in my little humble opinion. It says that while Jesus had no sin, God made him become sin for us so that you and I could become right with God. Jesus didn't sin, but he became the representation of every lie, every rape, every murder, every theft, every mean word. And he took that, all that failure, all that brokenness, all that choice, he took it on himself so that you and I could be right with God. This is the gospel finished. It's what Jesus says in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 through 25. It says this, you and I, we are utterly incapable of living the glorious life that God wills and wants for us. So God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he puts us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin, having faith in him sets us in the clear. Finished is what Jesus says. But salvation, throwing the rocks, trusting Jesus, it does not mean that our failures didn't happen. There is no memory exorcism. I'd be first in line. No, they happened. 
and I'm talking about your, not, not just the things people did to you, the sin that they did to you. That happened too. But the, the, your sin, your failure, it happened. People were hurt, possibly for a lifetime. It happened. God doesn't erase the failures of the past. That sounds like it would be cool and magical, but God actually does something more brilliant, something far better than just erasing the failures of the past, acting as if they never happened. But first, to illustrate, you remember the night on the, on the deck that I told you about with my friends driving home, couldn't see, cried. That was a Sunday night. That next day on Monday, I met with a professor from the Bible college I'd gone to and several other guys who were about my age starting out in ministry, and we'd meet each Monday. And so I drove there, and I remember walking, I was a little late, and uh, the, the professor could tell something was off with me, and he asked me, hey, Frizzell, are you okay? And I began to share about the night before, and I just began to cry. One, one of my buddies was next to me. He, he kept waiting for me to talk about how I got drunk and did something bad because of the way I was crying. But it was just the memory attack of who I had been. And after 10 minutes of me just trying to get through telling them about this, the professor points to a Bible down by my feet and he says, you pick that up. You turn to Romans chapter 8 and you read it all, like the whole chapter. And I knew Roman, Romans 8 pretty good. So I knew the first verse, like I, I anticipated this. And I got to it, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. That's about as far as I got. And I began to weep for the first time in my life over Scripture. Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no, no hammer, no guilty, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Romans 8. He, he made me read the whole chapter. It took forever because I'm a crybaby as I read this. But I wasn't, I wasn't who I had been because of Jesus. And, and what, I was, what God was doing in me in this season of my life was showing me that in the gospel, in God's safe love through Jesus on the cross. There is no room for shame. The Holy Spirit will convict of sin and guilt. And he's good at his job. But there's no room for shame. You see, once you're set free, you are free indeed. And so I'm like wrapped up in this on the, the couch. But there's more because I had to read the whole chapter. Here's what Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, and we know that all things work together. Some translation says God works all things together for good to those who love God. That, that Greek phrase, work together, the Greek word is synergeo. It's the, it's the word we get the English word synergy. You know what synergy is? I wrote it down. Um, here's what it is because I couldn't memorize this. The interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect greater than the sum of its individual parts. So all these individual parts. But when you combine them, there's something greater. The, the compa compounded effect of all these individual results or these individual moments or these individual choices. It says that God has this energy. You know, he's God. To take all of it and somehow work it together for good, the synergy of God. Like this is part of the good news and this working together is God's energy upon your life when and as you trust Jesus. It, there's, he doesn't erase the bad. He doesn't erase the pain. He doesn't erase your failures. He doesn't erase them. That'd be weird to act as if it, and I tried to live like that, to act as if it never happened. God does something bigger. He actually takes all of these, these individual parts and compounds them together. And through the power of the cross and the resurrection, God's synergy does something good with all of it. And this synergy is the redemptive power of the cross and the new life power of the resurrection. My third year of Bible college, 1997, if we're keeping score, I worked at a, at a country club. As a, as a waiter. And uh, I was there one night. Um, we had a big event, and I was uh, shutting the place down with one other waitress, and we got done. And uh, 
And this waitress was a good six or seven years older than me. Very attractive, very broken past. And without the details, she basically uh, told me if I wanted to follow her back to the dressing room, I could. And she walked back to the dressing room and stopped and turned and looked at me and then went in. And uh, girls, I get it. I mean, you're looking at me going, really? I don't get it. I, I get it. But I was pretty confident in my faith and pretty comfortable in my skin. And I think even for a guy like me, that sometimes can come off attractive. And she, she walked into this dressing room and I paused and I thought, even though I'm, I'm, I love God, I love my fiance, I remember think, my first thought was no one would know. This, this country club was pretty far out of town from where I lived. No one knew this person. No one would be here. It was late. No one would know. And I walked to the door. But I tricked you because I walked to the exit door, not the dressing room door. <laughs> and I got... I got in my 1979 Chevy Love pickup that would always backfire once you hit 60 miles an hour. And I rolled the window down and I had the radio on and I remember crying. And I know this is weird, but like I, I was so excited that like I could do this Christian life thing, that the Holy Spirit's work in my life, that I was saying yes to this, right? And here's what happened. I'm not making this up. It began to rain and I left the window down. And I remember thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Because I remembered that night, my junior year in high school, walking outside drunk, thinking there's got to be more than this. Because I'm pretending. I use alcohol to pretend. And I remember it just rained all over me and as I'm driving. And, and God does this. God will often, Jesus redeems us by recreating parts of our past at times. Tomorrow, you're going to talk about Jesus' conversation with Peter. After Peter's denials. And when they're face-to-face -face in John 21, as you'll see, Peter sees Jesus face-to-face -face in front of a Jesus-made charcoal fire. And the term for charcoal fire is only used two times in the Gospel of John. Once there in John 21 when they meet, and one other time in John 19 while Peter was warming his hands over a charcoal fire, swearing to heavens, to the heavens, I don't know the man. Jesus recreates. And with much more than that, as you'll see in John 18, excuse me, it's the fires of denial and failure. In John 21, it's the fires of redemption. This is called reconciliation. This is one of God's favorite words ever. It means to bring things into harmony as God intends. Reconciliation. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, it says this. Through Jesus, God reconciled everything. Pause, time out. Everything. God reconciled, brought back to the ultimate state of harmony. Everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. My wife and I had been married for a couple of years, and we were walking into a, a clothing store, and we literally ran into a girl from my past. And my wife knew all, all of my past. And I just remember being so awkward, and, oh, hey, how you doing? And Amy was so sweet, like she always is, and we, we go in, and I'm just like, Amy's just in, doing her thing, shopping, no big deal. And we get to the car, and I remember asking her if she'd drive, which I never asked for her to drive, because I'm a man, right? I like to drive. But I asked her if she'd drive, and I got in the car, and I'm just kind of sitting there. And she looks at me and says, hey, are you thinking about, are you okay? And, you know, it's what I do. I just began to cry. <laughs> and my wife, who's like little bitty and like so gentle and so sweet, she just begins to like go preacher on me, right? Like she begins to tell me who I am versus who I was. She begins to tell me about the things I preach about all the time. Dusty, that's real, okay? If you, if you believe it for these kids, then it's gotta be true for you. That's not who you, you're free of that. You're not, and I just, I'm receiving it, and I'm like, yeah, okay, got it. All right, let's, here, let me drive. No, I didn't do it, I let her drive. <laughs> Jesus reconciled my heart. 
Because as a kid, even though I was raised by a wonderful mom and by a dad who told me that girls are just a gift of God, to be respected, right? But I was so broken that I saw girls and women only as objects. But God reconciled this. He brought me into harmony. I'm not only my different person now, I've been a different person for a long time. And not only do I not see girls as objects, I see them as, as leaders in the kingdom of God, equal with, with guys, right? Which you know, Je regardless of what anybody else says, you know Jesus likes that because the guy had Luke chapter 8, female followers. They were like financing his ministry. Anyway, it's another sermon. But for years, part of how God has taken these individual pieces and compounded them together for something beautiful. From all the failures, 20 years of youth ministry, and one of the things that God has just been doing in me and through me is putting me around late women of God, women leaders, and then, and then doing everything I can to get them on my shoulders into even, even bigger leadership. And here's something cool. The, the girl that's been leading you all week, Brianne, who's gone tonight, she's gone tonight because the youth ministry I lead, she, she's really the leader. Like, she's the one that does it all. And so she's back taking care of this summer camp reunion. Um, this amazing young lady, Andy, that's been rocking out on the guitar all week, uh, she grew up in my youth ministry, and she's one of the best small group leaders we've ever had. And she's like, she's like basically running the Chick-fil-A near where we, we go to church, right? And constantly, I learn so much from them. Listen, listen, listen. Enough about me. Jesus says it's finished. It's finished. It's taken care of. Now, it's reconciled. Now it's time. God says to reconcile all things because the resurrection didn't just happen. It still happens. People come alive in the love of God, the safe love of God. So this whole reconciliation, this whole resurrection thing, it's true. It's true. But there's a moment of truth that you have to walk in if you have it. I want to help you. I'm going to ask you to do something that may be a little bit strange. So even if you don't, even if like somebody tells you to do something, you're like, well, I'm not going to do it. Because they tell you that's kind of who I am. I get it. Okay? So you don't have to do it. But I am going to ask you just for a, for a moment to close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now, if you're going to participate in this, just... I'm going to ask you to imagine some things, but if you don't want to participate, just eyes closed so that you don't bother someone who wants to. And I want you to imagine something in your mind with your eyes closed. I want you to imagine standing alone on a beach, not another person in sight, and you can see it in your mind's eye. It's a clear, beautiful day. The sun has just begun to go down, and you're watching it fall beyond the water, and you see it there in your mind's eye. And you begin to walk on the sand. The sun is still offering its last illumination of the world that you see, and you're walking with your hands in your pockets, if you can imagine that. You turn from the sun to what lies ahead on the beach as you walk along the shore, and you notice a figure coming toward you. The person's far enough ahead of you that you can't make out facial features. You're still walking. The two of you are getting closer and closer, and for some reason, you become nervous uneasy and anxious. And you probably already know this, but you realize as you get closer, it's Jesus. And with your eyes closed, just to imagine what he looks like in your mind's eye probably depends upon the movies you've seen or the portrayals of art. But all this is trivial because it, at least for this moment, this experiment, this is really him. And you're speechless. You're overwhelmed. Maybe your heart is pounding. Maybe even nervous. The creator of the universe. There. And you know now that he isn't cartoonish or weak or passive, but with fire in his eyes, he is the furious son of God and the creator of all things. And instinctively, in your mind's eye, you look down. Your hands are no longer in your pocket. Right there before you, your palms cup together and you see it 
in your palms as you look down, swimming in the palm of your hand is your unspoken filth, your failures, your secret sins. And I don't know how this is possible or even what this looks like to you, but you can't take your eyes off it all and you know Jesus is still there uncomfortably close. And as you stare at what lies in your hands, you're gripped with the weight and reality of your sin. Maybe it's embarrassment, guilt, maybe even self-hatred. And in your mind's eye, with your eyes closed, you slowly look up at Jesus in your mind's eye. And with your eyes closed, I just want to ask you, what's his expression on his face? What What does he say to you? Because the answer that your mind's eye gives may indeed be the way in which you view how God sees you in all of your humanity. So with eyes still closed, imagine this, for this is the truth of the gospel. As you look at Jesus, he smiles, not with mockery and not in a way that makes light of your sin, but he smiles at you with knowledge and love. And then he looks down and you think, no, no, Lord, 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 no, don't look there. Don't look at these things that I have done. So you look down too. But you notice immediately that the filth that had just moments ago resided in the palm of your hands is no longer there. Your hands are empty. You look to Jesus quickly, excited and hopeful. But you notice that he's still looking down. He isn't sad or defeated, but he's serious. You look to see what has captured his attention, and you see it immediately. He's looking into his own cupped Hands, And there, somehow, swimming in the palm of his hands is your filth, your failures, your sin. And you look back up at Jesus, maybe nervous, maybe ashamed, maybe for the first time, instead of feeling defensive, you feel sorry and broken. In your mind's eye, when you look back up into Jesus' face... How do you imagine him looking at you? You can open your eyes if you want. I want to tell you this. And this I believe with all of my heart and soul and everything in my bones. The way you and I believe God feels about us affects everything else. And Jesus came to earth to kick wide open the kingdom of God yelling out, ali, ali, oxen free, everyone is welcome because God's love is safe and I have made it so. Jesus has come to exclaim that God is Father and he is good and he is safe. And the walk, the moment of truth that each of us have to come to at some point is to drag our reality into the light, to have the courage to step into this truth that you never were able to carry your junk anyway. Your weight, your sin, your failure, you never carried it. You weren't strong enough. But the whole time, Jesus took it and said, it's finished. Stop living in shame. And instead, step into this reconciliation, the synergy of God. This, this white canvas, for our purposes here tonight, represents Jesus. Louis read a, a passage earlier. I want to read it again to you. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter, right? Peter. 1 Peter 2, cha- 24, he said, Jesus personally carried our sin on his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for him. By his wounds, you have been healed. The idea here is that this is you and this is me, this is our failure. And we know this. We've all got our stories, whether you're willing to share it on a, with a microphone on a stage or not. We've all got our stuff. It doesn't matter if we're unchurched and know very little or if we're very close to Jesus like Peter. We've all got our stuff. And a lot of us want to try to carry the weight or pretend like it didn't happen. It did happen. 
It did. It's part of what, it's part of the past that brought you to where you are now. But the truth is that for those who love God and part of loving God is having the courage to say, this is me. I've sinned. I can't carry it. I'm a failure. I'm on common ground with the world. But Jesus is the one that said, give it to me. I'll take it. It is finished. But part of the courage that you and I have to step into is to say, I never was able to carry it anyway. I never knew what to do with it. I could pretend it wasn't as bad as it actually was or as if it didn't ever happen. Or, or, I can believe that God is good. That because of Jesus, his love is safe. And I can believe that God takes all the individual parts, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and somehow he can compound them together with the power of the cross and the resurrection to bring out something good. We have a canvas here and a canvas. Well, this canvas is going to be here or another one will be there. And in a moment, the band's going to come and we're going to sing. But what I want to challenge, encourage you to do is to come forward at some point and you can take one of these bottles and you can spray maybe once, twice, just, just quick, just as, a, as an act of saying, I acknowledge, I admit that I've never really carried my failure. I mean, I've tried. I've acted strong and I've acted as if, no, I got this, God, I'm good, I don't need that or whatever. But the truth is, Jesus died for you. And some of you haven't thrown rocks. Some of you still, you know, I don't need this whatever, this Jesus thing or whatever, however, whatever language you use to call it. But here's the deal. You're on common ground with me. Because in the deep, dark places that you don't want to talk about, you know that your failures are more than just, ah. Some of your failures are more than just, ah, my bad. They were premeditated. You were a punk. You've done evil. You have sinned. You don't want to call it that? You're too liberal for that? Call it whatever you want. But in the deep, dark places, you know that there is this separation from God, the divine, the ultimate source, whatever you want to call him. And I would love to just challenge you that if you come down and spray the canvas, that it might be a moment of acknowledging for the first time in your life, okay, yes, Jesus. You're the one. I need you. You're the Messiah. You're not military. You died on the cross for me. And for the rest, I know most of you have done that. And so that for you, this may be a moment of just acknowledging. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, don't, don't forget who you were before you were called. You see, God often reminds us of the past, not to humiliate us but to remind us of his energy that is reconciling all things for good for him. And so for some of you, maybe you're like me and you kind of have, you know, you kind of push that stuff off to the side pretending like it never happened. No, no, no. It happened. But God is big and brilliant and good. And he has reconciled all things. And the power of the cross and the resurrection will synergize with your life for good. I'm going to ask you to stand, but not to rush the stage. You can go ahead and stand. But I'm going to ask you not to come to the front, because after I pray, I want to invite any of you that want to, during the song, that you might come and just spray the canvas, acknowledging, Jesus, you have carried the weight of my sin. And you've said, it is finished. So no more shame. Pray with me, Lord. May you be lifted high in this place with our hearts. God, as we spray this canvas, may it be a reminder that these things happened. These failures, these sins, those done to us and those that we have chosen. That it's real, 
It's a part of this reality. It has affected this life, this world, this creation, and people that we love. But we're also acknowledging with every spray that you are brilliant and that you are in the process even still of reconciling all things, everything in heaven and on earth through the blood of Jesus on the cross, through the resurrection that brings hope and new life to these dry and weary bones and souls that we are alive and made new. And so, God, we spray this paint with smiles on our faces because we're not defeated, we don't live in shame. God, that we are alive, that resurrection happens because of Jesus. And God, for the young man or young woman who still says no, who says, I don't, I just, it's not for me. Move. Holy Spirit, please move. Do what only you can do. Jesus, may you be lifted high as my friends come and spray this canvas. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.